All right, so this is one of the experiments. This location is ISSR3. We're in the squid room. This is the location number three, and this is a stalagmite. This is one of those that we've actually cored through it. And what we've put on top of it is a uh, plastic bag that has clay in it. And on top of that plastic bag with clay in it, we put a glass plate that's in this holder carved out of uh, PVC to keep it from uh, the plate from wandering around. And again, this is one of those sites where um, we had to convince ourselves that we saw the seasonal pattern of growth rate high in the winter when it's cool and the air outside is dense, comes in low CO2, CO2 air outside the cave, comes in, displaces the high CO2 air in the cave, drives calcite to precipitate. In the summer, it's the opposite. The hot air is outside compared to the cave air. As a result, the air in the cave is stagnant and the CO2 uh, accumulates. As the CO2 accumulates, it actually shuts off calcite growth. So we would be here, we'd be staring at these plates. They're being dripped on. One, two, Mississippi, three. So once every 1.5 seconds, that's a pretty fast uh, drip rate for this cave. You can hear other drips in this cave, in this room. We've got several of these monitored and we can observe that it's being dripped on fast and that zero calcite is growing, right? We weigh these plates with a microanalytical balance, we could weigh it out to like five places, Gesundheit. I hope to get a balance one day that'll go up to 11. If you can see, yeah. the numbers all go to 11, look. And so it goes to five decimal places and we could measure precisely the plate weight before we take it out and put it here, then we take it back, we clean it with clean water, we dry it in a clean environment, and then we weigh it, and by difference we could see how much calcite has accumulated. And no matter what we do, nothing in the summer. It's not just that it slows down, it actually completely shuts off in the warmest summer months. Okay, and uh, so one thing about this room is, is its name, and we want to find the signature formation. So maybe we could uh, look around, and I'm going to point to this one. We have it in the shot. Is this the signature formation of the squid room? That's kind of squiddish, isn't it? This one's kind of squiddish. That one is kind of squiddish. Oh, <laughs> whoa, look at that one. If I was naming this room, that would be the formation, I would say, is the signature formation. Let's look at this stalagmite right here and where it's sourced from. It's one of these drips up above is actually feeding. So calcite's precipitating off of one of these, one of these stalactites up here. I'd have to get rid right underneath it to tell which one. Then it's drip, dripping on here. It's flowing down and it's flowing underneath along what I would say is the best cave bacon example I've ever seen. You could actually see the individual crystals of calcite, right? They're growing from, they started up here and they grow down this way. So this part is youngest, this part is oldest. And the individual crystals grow, but then you could see within the bacon, the laminae that are lines of equal age. The tips of all the crystals at one point were here, then they were here, then they were here, and then here. How astounding is that? Then follow it down to here and it's dripping off the edge of the bacon and it's forming a new stalagmite. Wow. So you can imagine what's going on at each step along the way in terms of changing calcite saturation state, the water continuing to degas, and it still has some calcite to give up when it's done with that long flow path. We will subscribe Jeff to go grab the water sample. Water? Left you time to collect water. Perfect. Tune your ear to just that plate. Three.
about 40, right before you said done. Mm -hmm. All right. It's about 1.5 per minute. This is an ultrameter, too. It's an instrument that measures conductivity of the water, its pH, and its temperature. So the conductivity is a measure of how conductive the water is. The higher the level of dissolved ions, the more conductive the water will be. So it's a way, it's a very quick and easy measurement to infer the total dissolved solids or the salinity of a given water sample. And so what we're doing now is taking some of the water that was captured and using it to purge the meter. And then we're going to fill it up for the measurement. Hopefully we'll have enough. And we do. So, someone can record these numbers, so I'll read them off. So the conductivity is 446.3, and the units are micro siemens. It's a micron symbol with a capital S. Micro siemens, it's a measure of conductivity. The temperature is 22.6 degrees C. The uh, equivalent pH is 301.8 parts per million. Wait, pH? No, TDS, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> total, total dissolved solids, which is a measure, which is just taking the conductivity and using a coefficient. It's 301.8 parts per million, which is equivalent to 301.8 milligrams per liter total dissolved solids. So does that conform with drinking water standards? Is that dilute enough to drink, assuming there were no contaminants in it? So usually it's like a thousand ppm. Below a thousand ppm is a drinking water standard. And now we're going to go to pH. The pH is seven point six five. Yeah, buddy. All right. So now we have a measure of total dissolved solids in the water. It's acidity and its temperature, and its drip rate. Now we're going to make a comparison with another site in this room, and to do that we're going to move on from here.